morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome to our third construction and engineering webinar of 2023. My name is Catherine Andrews. I'm a partner here in the construction and engineering team at Burkitt's. Um, if we could have the first slide, please. So hopefully Burkitt's will be familiar to most of you. We're a top 50 full service uh, law firm with six offices across the east of England, London, and most recently Seven Oaks. Um, we now have over a thousand staff um, working with throughout those offices for our client base. Uh, next slide, please. I'll now take the opportunity to introduce our speakers for today's webinar. Firstly, we have uh, Patrick Cooney, who is a legal director in our team. Um, he deals with both development work and contentious work, so he's a good all-rounder for any construction questions you might have. Um, Secondly, we're pleased to welcome today a guest speaker, which is the Head of Construction Client Development at Miller Insurance, Jason Baston. Um, many thanks to Jason for joining us today. And finally, last but not least, we have Stephen Williams, who is a solicitor in our team, and he um, specialises in dispute work. So welcome to all of the panel. Uh, next slide, please. Just to confirm what uh, we we're going to talk about today. So first up, Patrick's having a look at adjudication, following a number of requests for more of a focus on this key area of construction dispute resolution work from our previous webinars. Um, next up, we have Jason, who's looking at water damage claims in construction, which are on the up, and we'll discuss how the industry is responding to those from an insurance perspective. Uh, Stephen will then take us through a few recent cases, again with a focus on adjudication. And finally, we'll come back for a short Q&A session with the panel. There will be an opportunity to put your questions to the panel, and those questions will only come in to myself, so are confidential, so please feel free um, to send them through. Um, we have had a fa fantastic turnout today, so we can't promise to get to every question, but we can come back to you should there be anything following the seminar you'd like to discuss further. Um, other housekeeping points, the session is being recorded and will be circulated to delegates afterwards um, within the next week um, together with the slides. Furthermore, the sessions are all on our Burkitt's YouTube channel should you wish to go back and um, review any of the key points. Um, the next slide, please. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Patrick to have a look at um, some adjudication points. Thanks, Patrick. Hello everyone, um, we cover some quite specific topics in these um, webinars, so we're going to take a step back and just look at the whole adjudication process uh, in overview. Um, I mean, what is adjudication? Not everyone's been through an adjudication process. Um, it's effectively a short form, sometimes described as rough and ready dispute resolution process, and the whole process is decided in pretty much 28 days. Um, it can be extended, um, which I'll, I'll come back to, but really it's a one month process. So if you're dealing with any kind of um, standard form construction contract or a professional appointment, your contract will contain a right to refer a dispute to adjudication as an alternative to court. Um, but if you're dealing with a construction contract, and it doesn't contain that right, it will be implied anyway by something called the Scheme for Construction Contracts. So you can't uh, contract out of it if you're a party to a construction contract. It's implied by law. So it kind of leads on to the question of uh, what is a construction contract? Um, all defined in the Construction Act, which came out in 1996 and was uh, updated a little in 2009. Um, I mean, we're not going to go into this in detail, but for all intents and purposes, um, pretty much anything that's physical works is covered. The, the definition of what a construction contract is is very broad. Um, any kind of works agreement, uh, professional appointment in connection with a building project, it will be a construction contract. So if adjudication rights not in there anyway, which it should be, it'll be implied by law. Um, who are adjudicators? Well. 
Uh, the person deciding your dispute will be a senior professional in the industry with expertise relevant to your dispute. So if uh, your dispute is about a final account, for example, there'll be a senior QS. If it's more of a legal contractual issue that you've referred, they'll probably have a legal background. If it's about drawings, there'll be architects or engineers. So um, expertise relevant to the dispute. It's important to bear in mind that um, the decision of an adjudicator is binding, even where you think they've got it wrong. Um, it's often known as interim binding because if you get an adjudicator's decision against you, you do have to comply with it, subject to some very limited exceptions, which I'll come on to. Uh, but you do have the option of referring the entire dispute to a court subsequently. So if you think you've got a bad decision, you have to pay up but then you can take the same thing to a, to a court if you think it's been a bit, uh, you know, um, if the adjudicator's got it wrong, basically. And that's why it's known as interim binding. Um, I've mentioned um, enforcement in the High Court in that next bullet point. Um, the, court, um, the courts are very well set up for enforcing adjudicators' decisions. If you get one against you and you don't comply with it, um, the claimant, the referring party, has the right to take you to um, a division of the High Court, the Technology and Construction Court, um, specialist judges, um, quick process. They're very alive to um, adjudication, obviously dealing with them all the time. Um, and they will, it's a very um, bespoke and quick court process for um, elevating a, an adjudicator's decision to the status of a court judgment so that the courts are, are all set up for this. And that pay now, argue later um, point I've mentioned is all about paying up if you get one against you and then arguing later in court if, if you want to. In terms of how the fees work, I mean, it's very, very different from going to a court. I mean, it's very different in all respects in, in terms of the, the short time scales. Uh, the process is much more condensed, obviously much less formal process than going to a court. Uh, and a really big difference is that the parties bear their own legal fees in adjudication. Okay, so that huge cost risk in, in litigation, uh, which is that if you, if you lose your claim, you've not only paid all of your own legal fees, but you have to pay all the other side's legal fees as well for what could be an 18-month process. Um, it's just not present in adjudication. Uh, you each pay your own fees. Um, I've mentioned there that you do pay the adjudicator's fees, though. Um, the adjudicator will be a senior professional with their own sort of hourly rate, and they have the ability to decide who pays their fees and in what proportion. Um, so when the adjudicator issues their decision, the parties may have made lots of submissions about who's been unreasonable and um, why um, they should pay the fees, et cetera, et cetera. But in my experience, adjudicators don't really have any truck with that. So they generally um, award payment of their fees based on the result. So if you lose 100% of a claim, you'll probably have to pay all of the adjudicator's fees. Uh, if you um, succeed on your claim, but only 50% of it, then you'll have to pay the fees 50-50 and so on. That's normally how they do things. So it's a very short process. So what disputes can be referred to adjudication? Uh, well, pretty much any dispute. There isn't really a restriction on what can be referred. You just need a, a dispute. Um, obviously very very complex disputes that's where you might think you it's a bit rough and ready for adjudication but that doesn't mean that the process can't be used um, i've mentioned in the last point there that the dispute must have crystallized so there must be a genuine sort of dispute you couldn't um, surprise the other party by just ambushing them with a claim which they had absolutely no inclination, um, absolutely no idea about, that they didn't even know that you that you thought you were owed this money, for example. But it's it's not a great threshold to get over to show that a dispute is crystallized. Um, really, you just need to send a letter to the other side saying, we consider we're owed X, Y, and Z, for example, for these reasons, you know, this is our claim, you know, come back to us within seven days. And if they respond within that time frame saying, well, we don't agree or we think you drew a lesser sum or whatever it may be, there's your dispute. Or even if they don't um, respond at all, you've got a dispute, you've put a claim, it's, it's been ignored. So it, it's, not, um, it's not a huge hurdle to get over. 
So on to the next slide, let's have a look at the process in a little bit more um, detail. How do you start the process? Well, the, the claimant or the referring party, they send a notice of adjudication, that's the first step. And that's what sets the, um, starts the clock ticking. So when that notice is sent, um, I should cover what's in that notice. It, it's a summary of, of the dispute, all the background facts, um, what you're claiming and what you're asking the, the adjudicator to, to decide. So you send that to the other to the other side, and then that clock starts to tick. And within the next seven days, the refer referring party has to get an adjudicator appointed and then send the actual full claim document called the referral to the adjudicator and to the other side within that seven day period. Um, so you can imagine if you've only got seven days to send your referral to you know, uh, adjudicator and defendant um, after sending that notice of adjudication, you'd be mad to send that notice before the referral was ready because you're going to be really up against the clock to hit that seven day um, time frame. Uh, in terms of how adjudicators are appointed, uh, you can agree adjudicators between you, but in practice I find that very rare because if you suggest that Mr or Mrs X is, is your adjudicator, the other side is automatically sceptical, you know, why do you want them, given you a good decision in the past, have they? Um, it's much more common to apply to a nominating body like REBA or the RICS who have panels of all the regular adjudicators and they tend to be on all the same panels. You pay them a fee and they will nominate an adjudicator with relevant um, expertise for you. So the adjudicator is appointed and receives the claim document within that seven day period. Next stage is the responding party or your defendant issues their response. Now, it'll be up to the adjudicator how long you have to do that, but bear in mind the clock's now ticking and the adjudicator's got to issue the decision within 28 days of, being, um, of receiving that referral document. So if they've got to issue a decision by day 28, they're not going to give you, you know, 21 days to issue your response. It's going to be a pretty short time frame, maybe five days, seven days at most. So um, you can see that as if you're responding to an adjudication, you're really going to be up against it unless you've done lots of prep in advance. Um, stage four, um, further submissions. The adjudicator will normally allow at least one more submission um, per party, but in terms of you know the rest of the process, it's really up to the adjudicator whether they call site meetings, uh, you know, in-person meetings. Um, that's really up to the adjudicator. Uh, in practice, it does tend to be done all uh, sort of paper-based submissions, but you know, it's it, it's a matter of uh, adjudicator discretion the process and then we get to stage five they issue that decision within day 28. I've mentioned that unless extended that 28 day period can be extended by two weeks if the the claimant the referring party agrees only their consent is needed for that. Um, you could have a longer extension if both parties agree but that's not that common because the whole reason for launching an adjudication is that you want a quick decision. So um, the referring party is unlikely to agree to, to lengthy extensions beyond those 14 days. A um, couple of related questions at the bottom. What if the adjudicators got it wrong? Um, well, that all, was all decided by the courts in the early days. Um, decisions were sort of referred to the courts which were plainly wrong and the court said it doesn't matter, you've got to pay up. Um, pay now, argue later. They, the courts recognise that adjudication's got a specific purpose. The industry needed a, a, process, a process which was quick uh, and issued a binding decision to get money in the right hands to avoid insolvencies. And the whole process would be undermined if, if, um, if decisions could be avoided because the adjudicator had, had got it wrong, it would all fall down. So your opportunity to um, correct that wrong, as it were, is by taking the same decision to the court later on. And that's the whole pay now, argue later principle I mentioned earlier. Uh, is there any ever basis for an avoiding a decision of an adjudicator? There are, there are some, it's rare. Um, there's really only two grounds. One is if the adjudicators um, decided something which 
was beyond the scope of what was asked of them in the first place. So if they've gone beyond the jurisdi their jurisdiction, if they've um, answered effectively a different question from that which was asked of them in the um, in the notice, um, that is one ground. And, and the other is only really if they've if the adjudicator has been um, unfair, um, gross, grossly unfair in the process, um, then, then you might be able to avoid uh, a decision. But really, they're, they're the only two grounds, really. OK, let's have a look at a specific type of adjudication briefly. On to the next slide, please. You might have heard the term um, smash and grab adjudications in the context, context of payment. Um, Let's have a quick recap on payment notices. Um, I'm sure you'll know that um, in construction contracts, there's this con um, concept of the sum due or what's now called the, the notified sum. Um, the payment notice, whether it's coming from the paying party or the receiving party, the payee, that sets the notified sum. So that's the sum that has to be paid by the final date for payment. Um, which should also be in the contract. And again, if it's not, it'll be implied by the scheme unless a pay less notice is issued. Okay, so you must pay that notified sum um, on or before the final date for payment unless you've issued that pay less notice. Um, so if you haven't, if you want to pay a lesser sum than, than is in the payment notice and you haven't issued a pay less notice at all, or you issue it late, or it's not a valid pay less notice because it's too vague. Um, that leads to what's called a smash and grab situation. The contractor, for example, in that situation will be in, entitled to the sum due purely because you haven't issued the right paperwork. Um, I've said if no pay less notice, but it, you could also get the same situation if you don't issue a valid payment, if you don't issue a valid payment notice either. Let's take the example of a standard sub JCT contract where the contractor issues a payment application um, setting out how much they you know, think they should be paid. The employer then, or the project manager, EA on the employer's behalf, issues a payment notice, which sort of trumps the application and, and sets the sum due. But if the employer doesn't do that, um, or does it late, then the application from the contractor sets the sum due. So you've got a default application, sort of a def default notified sum situation. And again, that sum will be due if you don't issue um, well, either your payment notice or your second bite of the cherry, your pay less notice. And that all leads to what's known as a smash and grab situation. Um, so very important on the pay less notices, you've got to issue them on time and explain how that lesser sum has been calculated. OK, uh, next slide, please. Uh, that was a, a fairly brief overview of the process, but there's a, there's a few key takeaways um, for adjudication. One is very much uh, an obvious point from the time, really, that um, sort of ambush and having lever arch files, you know, me megabytes of documents um, dumped on you the, the, without any notice is, is just part of the process. In the early days of adjudication, defendants... Um, used to try and run the argument that we had no idea there was this volume of documentation there's no way we're going to get through it the referring party sent all this to us we've only got five days to respond it doesn't it doesn't matter it's just part of the process if adjudication is going to work that's just part of the process so if you know that there's a dispute rumbling that might go to adjudication um, the advice is do, do your homework, get your sort of case ready, um, start preparing your sort of submission, as it were, get any sort of evidence you might need and just do your work in advance because five, seven days is, 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 is not going to be enough. Uh, number two, just, just be aware that it is a binding process, um, even where the adjudicators got it wrong. That's the whole pay now, argue later principle. And if you ignore the decision, you'll then get taken to court for summary judgment. Then you'll have a whole load of legal fees to pay um, as well as the adjudication decision itself. And then the third sort of takeaway is um, following on from that previous slide about smash and grab risk um, is the importance of issuing payment notices. Um, and, and if you want to a pay less notice um, on time, and valid in terms of its content. I mean, it's worth saying you don't need to pay less notice if you issued a payment notice and you're, you know, that's the sum you're going to pay. 
But if something comes to light as a, as a PM after you've issued your payment notice, you've got that second bite of the cherry to issue a payless notice. Very important to get it in on time so you don't face that smash and grab risk and make sure it's valid in terms of its content. It's got to explain the lesser sum that you're going to pay and why. It doesn't need to be the most detailed calculation in the world, but um, I would recommend a, um, a short form calculation at least, you know, sort of amount you applied for or amount in the payment notice, lesser sum being paid, and then the reasons for paying less and allocate a figure to those reasons if you can, so that you've, you've explained in a reasonable level of detail why you're paying less. Okay, that was a fairly sort of ra rapid overview of the process, but sometimes it's helpful to look at it in, in a sort of summary way rather than at discrete um, issues. Uh, I'm going to um, hand over to Jason now, who's going to talk about um, water damage in the context of construction. Fantastic. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. And uh, thank you to Patrick. That was really useful, actually, uh, especially the importance of the payment and payless notices being on time and, and being valid. There's always something new to learn in construction. It makes every day different, doesn't it? And I, I, I love it for that reason. There's always new challenges coming along, too, uh, it seems. And of course, just this week, we've had Rack in the spotlight, uh, too, which is uh, no doubt turning attention of many. What's nice to see as well is that the industry is evolving, the increasing adaptability of the industry to respond to these new and emerging challenges that just seem to be ever growing in frequency. And I'd like to hope that today's session can contribute to uh, that adaptation too. So you've heard from Patrick already, his excellent presentation about the key aspects of adjudication there. And later you're gonna hear about the recent uh, construction and engineering legal cases. But first, I'm going to talk about the surge in water damage claims that's happening during construction. It doesn't get the uh, it doesn't get the focus. It's not on the radar of many. Uh, and so actually, this might be a surprise for a lot of people. Uh, I hope that it helps uh, to raise the awareness. And also, uh, I'm going to explain how the industry is evolving and, and how you can help uh, the industry to be a part of that adaptation and evolution to meet these challenges that we're facing. So if we've not had the pleasure of meeting before, I'm Jason Baston. I've worked in specialty risks for over 20 years, focused principally on construction for over a decade now. And I've worked with many of the UK's largest employers, developers and contractors. And so I've had an opportunity, if you like, to see the industry's challenges through many different lenses. Let's take a look at how this section, session is going to be structured today. I'll give you a quick introduction to Miller. And then we'll split the session into two parts. We'll have a quick refresh of water damage just to give some context to the discussions. And we're then going to focus in particularly on water escape. So uh, Miller, it's been in business as, a, as an entity for 120 years now, but that doesn't mean that you've heard of it and you might not have heard of us before, mainly because we're not on the high street. We don't try to be everything to everybody. We just focus on being industry leaders in specialisms. But when you know us and you work with us, you realize how much that expertise matters. I'll give you some examples. Our marine team, they represent almost all of the world's ocean going tonnage. Our sports specialists already represent over half of the England football squad, men's and women's teams, all of the Premier League clubs and much of top flight football. If you go to see any bands or major artists at concerts, our entertainment team will more than likely be behind the scenes of those. And our professional risks team already protect over a thousand law firms in the UK alone. And then two years ago, recognizing that there was this huge need and gap in the market for dedicated construction experts to be providing some risk and insurance guidance to the sector, Miller decided to invest in creating a huge new construction team. And we're really changing the industry. We've already got over 30 experts who are dedicated solely to construction. We're already the sole risk and insurance partner of Build UK, the leading lobbying body in the UK. And ultimately, we're here to make sure that people are actually getting the right cover in construction to protect them when things go wrong, but also only buying really what they need, which often brings cost savings. So the message is actually, if you've got an annual construction insurance, PI renewal, project cover, a bond even, you really need to be speaking with us to just sense check what you're currently doing and what you have in place. So next slide, please. Okay, so now we're gonna move on and have a look at water damage. 
So damage can be slow, it can be from minor leaks. I'm sure every single person on this call today has seen water leaks before. Sometimes, of course, though more damagingly, they can be sudden and, and catastrophic. Damage can be to your own property, but it can also be to the property of others. And sometimes the damage to the property of others is much greater in value. Signs of the damage that you'll see is often dirt and debris, maybe water staining, sometimes pollution too. But given the rise of electric, electrical uh, installations in buildings now, typically you'll also see short circuiting of electrical devices. It's often a key sign. But when that moisture hangs around, you're going to have swelling of timbers, wooden flooring, buckling, delamination, also rusting, rotting. And of course, a more common problem now is the mould and bacterial growth. Next slide, please. So what causes all of these water incidents? Where is it coming from? Well, when I'm out on site and we first start talking about water mitigation, or water damage mitigation, should I say, what most people typically think of and go to is ingress. And what that is, is water coming from outside of the building in. It's typically from failure of the building's integrity, defects, incomplete works too. So there could be weather events that breach the building envelope. In winter, you might have frozen pipes or snow. Often, and it's been in the press a lot over the last decade, flood from surplus external water or perhaps from inundated or defective drainage systems. You can, of course, get penetrating damp. And given the growth in use of basement, sometimes as well, we see that hydrostatic pressure creating a breach of the substructure. But what is lesser known and what is actually causing much more pain and headache in the industry, if you like, is escape of water. So hence that's going to be the topic of today's discussion. And what escape of water is concerned with is water that's already in the building. So this is often forgotten or it's misunderstood as a cause of damage. It often comes from accidental damage, from defects in design, workmanship's material, but it can be from vandalism or malicious damage too. The utilities, the plumbing, the ablution systems, often leakage and joint failure leads to these kinds of escape or wa of water instances. But often we see sprinklers, particularly high pressure systems and risers bursting uh, and causing major uh, upsets towards the end of developments. And then also you might have storage systems and tank failures to consider too. I'll just touch on another cause of water damage as it's relevant, which is condensation. Of course, there might be poorly insulated pipework, exterior walls too, uh, and that tends to be more of a gradual water damage process. And one that often gets forgotten when it comes to water damage is firefighting. Of course, fire goes up, but water goes down. And historically, fire has been the most common cause of construction losses historically, and it actually has had an awful lot of attention, uh, of course, as a joint code of practice for fire safety, because it has, adds a threat to life uh, as well. So there's been a lot of work to mitigate the fire risks in construction. And perhaps there's now uh, some work underway for the risks of water uh, catching up on that piece, because water is needed to fight fires. And so even a small fire often gets doused heavily by the fire brigade. Uh, and so perhaps at this point, let's have a look at our first case study for today. For the next slide, please. Thank you. So some on the call might remember this one. It was on the BBC News. It was the Leonardo building in Leeds city centre on a Saturday night. It broke out on the top floors of a derelict high rise building uh, near the city's Millennium Square. It's about 10 to 8 on the Saturday evening. So full of people out and about enjoying themselves on that Friday night. Now, at the time, it was undergoing a 60 million pound fit out stu for student accommodation, eight storeys, uh, as was reported with a fire in the top three floors. Thankfully, the building was reported as vacant and no one was injured. But particularly relevant to this uh, discussion today is that there were 10 engines on scene to drench that fire. So whilst we've got a, a fire in the top three floors, it's inevitable that significant water damage will have also occurred on those floors below in the building, in addition to the fire damage that made the headlines that day. Next slide, please. Thank you. So why is water damage so important? Well, 
it's a really silent menace. It just doesn't get the headlines. You know, that fire that was on the BBC News. But if you had a similar incident with a water escape, no one would know about it. It wouldn't get the headlines. It wouldn't get the attention, if you like. And therefore, of course, the significance of these kinds of events is considered to be, whilst equal, uh, not necessarily getting the attention. So there's been this huge increase in frequency and severity of water damage instances, which I'll come on to in a moment. But if you want some statistics, it's now caught up with fire as one of the major causes of construction claims. Now, insurers have different claims histories across each insurer, of course, but generally they're suggesting 25% of their losses now come from fire and a similar proportion now come from water damage. Of course, fire mitigation has been inherent in the industry for decades now, but with a, a bit of a slower take up, if you like, to mitigation of water damage, what we're now starting to see is that for some insurers, water is overtaking fire as their biggest cause of construction losses. There are some reasons for that too. The damage potential is growing. We're seeing increased high rise developments. As I mentioned, fire goes up, water goes down. So the more floors you've got, the more potential there is for the water to pour through multiple uh, sites and, and ultimately give you greater losses. We're seeing huge increases in construction costs. It's no surprise to anybody about the inflation figures at the moment. And we're also seeing higher value fit outs too. So of course, when losses do happen, the values of those losses are much greater. Many buildings are multi-tenanted now. So when these kinds of losses occur, it's often not just the works themselves and maybe the landlord and their building that suffers the loss. It's often other tenants too. And there's been a huge rise in the use of technology and growth of use of electricals and IT within buildings. And of course, as we all know, none of that bodes well when it gets uh, in contact with water. We've got another point as well, which is driving this rise in water losses. It's the timing. Losses like this typically occur in the final weeks of projects, when the values at risk, when the project is almost complete and the exposures, if you like, are at their greatest. They often occur undetected too, uh, typically over weekends or over night times, uh, because very often pressure tests, for example, are done at the end of the week. And as I mentioned, water escapes just don't get the same profile. So people are not necessarily thinking about how they mitigate those losses when they're developing the project plans. Another piece is the transition to MMC. Of course, we're seeing more timber, the use of greater levels of timber in construction now. And wood doesn't naturally uh, react well when it gets wet. So of course, that is creating a bit of a headache. The growth of use of modular as well, whilst it brings lots of positive risk elements to a profile, it also creates the potential for series losses. Take, for example, a bathroom pod uh, being installed uh, across a hotel, you know, potentially hundreds of those pods in one building. It only takes one defect in one of those bathroom pods to create a water damage incidents that might actually be replicated, you know, scores of times. And so you can see how something so minor might actually create a, a major headache in terms of values of losses for developers and ultimately their insurers. But it creates lots of disruption. And really, the reason it's so important is because of the effects that water damage has. It's not just the cost to insurers. There's actually enormous other issues. And perhaps many of the people on this call today will have experienced these. The first one, of course, is delays to the project. If you're a hotel and you're planning to open and start taking your revenue from day one, well, any delay to that project is going to be a, a significant hindrance on the uh, on the cost benefit of that development and ultimately it's going to be a, a major problem. The risk of insufficient drying and ongoing mould, if those are not taken care of and the moisture levels are not reduced sufficiently, of course there can be new problems created and mould has been in the press quite a lot recently. The future revenue losses as I mentioned and potentially the additional costs of having to find alternative premises or lose that revenue, or indeed find alternative sources of supply, it can create uh, quite substantial differences to the balance sheet of any development. And then particularly for the contracting chain, the liquidated damages that can result as a, as a, as a byproduct, if you like, of the delays. 
but let's not forget, not everything in a construction project is insurable. So there will always be uh, uninsured losses and, and risks that sit still with the developers and the contractors. There's a huge reputational damage because nobody wants to be seen as the responsible party for a major loss and a major delay to the opening of a new development. And naturally, of course, as we've touched on today and we'll hear more about, everything like this leads to major legal disputes and finger pointing as to who's responsible and who should be uh, having uh, negligence uh, claims levelled against them. So, given all, all of that, insurers are starting to take action and help to effectively mitigate some of the issues that they're facing in the industry and help the industry to evolve and adapt. They are themselves uh, giving a reduced appetite for exposed projects. So they may not be so interested in taking part in certain projects that have a big exposure to escape of water, or indeed we do see sometimes a refusal to take part at all in certain projects. The uh, insurers want to charge typically increased premiums where those projects are heavily exposed and also they're increasing the excesses on those policies and it might surprise you to know that for large projects they can now be as high for water damage alone as £150,000 so it is a considerable amount of risk exposure that needs to be considered when it comes to mitigating those water escape issues. But of course, what it also does is it gives the industry an incentive through a little bit of a carrot and stick mechanism to reduce those excesses to help get that risk management under control and provide the evidence and the certainty that's needed that those mitigation pieces are in place. So let's move on and have a look at the next slides, please. So as I mentioned, there's a sharp rise in the frequency and the severity of claims caused by escape of water on construction sites now. And let's perhaps use some case studies to evidence exactly what these look like. So this first one is a medical facility. It was a multi-story state-of-the-art clinical block. Incorporated some specialist units and some surgical theatres, uh, but of course, any block like this needs to be an optimum clean room uh, and, and high sanitary requirements. So this development was just days from handover. It was in the process actually of being demobilised at the time of the loss. And the evening of the final stages of testing and commissioning were being carried out. They were flushing out the systems. They were running water through all parts of the pipe work in the building. And What's interesting with this particular development was something that was really, really sort of good uh, proactive foresight was that they had incorporated some automatic shutoff systems into the flow system that monitored the flow and where there was excess flow, it would effectively shut that flow off after a short time period. The only challenge was, was that there were showers in the building and those showers were not connected to the automatic shutoff systems. So you might see where this is going. <laughs> On the following morning, there was a large escape of water discovered, which had come from the upper floors. And those upper floors, of course, the water had cascaded down to the floors below. The water had actually been flowing for 10 hours prior to the discovery. So for some floors, it was already up to five centimetres. There was naturally extensive damage to flooring, partitioning, electrical services, doors, ceilings, of course, the integrated units and the operating theatres too. There was significant physical damage and an enormous claim submitted. Key as well though here, there was a six month delay as a result of this in handover. So what were the influencing factors, if you like, in this particular instance? Well, there was protective plastic coverings in the waste outlet in the shower trays. But as is often the case, those covers hadn't been removed. So when the showers accidentally started filling up those trays, of course the water overflowed and it didn't take long for it to pour through the building. And quite simply, the message was that they'd done some brilliant work with the automatic shutoff systems and it's exactly the sort of thing that insurers want to be uh, seeing on developments. But sadly, the showers hadn't been connected up to that system. Also, what might have mitigated all of this is if the right personnel checks and monitoring had taken place on the evening of that testing and commissioning. They might have well seen that actually the system wasn't fully sealed. 
Next slide, please. So let's have a look at a second example of this. So this was a major escape in one of London's tallest buildings. It's in that picture, but uh, I won't identify it out of confidentiality. But ultimately, the water escape occurred on commercial floors after a sprinkler riser had been repressurized on a Friday afternoon. That poorly fitted joint failed, but it failed some hours after the repressurization. Unfortunately, by the time the event was discovered by the security guard doing his walk around at the weekend, there of course had been extensive and catastrophic damage already to multiple floors throughout the, uh, that high rise building. The water actually continued to flow even after it had been discovered for some hours, because of course the security guard needed to find the right people in order to find the location of the isolation valves and stop that water flowing. So although the valve itself, the piece that was defective, was small scale really in terms of the overall costs that we're dealing with here, ultimately multiple floors beneath the source of that water was subjected to extensive damage. And the commercial occupants of all of those affected floors suffered significant business interruption. They had to vacate their premises and relocate Okay, whilst of course there was the drying, the renovation, much of their IT equipment had to be replaced, got data challenges with all of that too. In sum, the losses incurred as a result of this one escape of water were over 30 million pounds. And I hope that that gives you some idea of the scale of the losses that water escape can create. So we'll move on and have a little look now at some of the origins of escape of water and exactly what the industry is doing to tackle these challenges. Fundamentally, it's about risk management and risk, man um, risk mitigation from the design stage right through to the operation. It's about on-site management and the assignment of responsibility. This is something which has been inherent in the industry for fire, but the way the industry is now required to evolve is that they need to consider a similar approach as the joint code of practice for water escape too. So that on-site management and assignment of responsibility for water is one of the key things. Having permit systems in place and other management systems uh, associated with any water activities are key. Making sure that the workmanship on site is high quality we're all aware of the challenges of labour at the moment in the industry, but it really is about avoiding inexperienced or untrained personnel when those fittings are being used. Key as well is the joint testing, the verification of those installations and making sure that actually that testing process is robust, but also that there may well be various walkarounds that are needed after that process is complete, just as there are with hot works permits. And then of course, emergency planning. Now, with the best intentions and with the best approaches that you may be able to implement on a site, sometimes water escape will still occur, but it's then what you do about that particular instance to mitigate the, uh, the, the loss getting worse, and ultimately everybody knowing who to go and talk to, where the isolation valves are, et cetera. So the industry itself, if we move on to the next slide, please. So the industry has made a collective effort, if you like, over recent years, which has led to the development of some formal industry guidance. And this guidance isn't known to everybody. And so the benefit of today's uh, discussion is that I'd like to uh, give you free access to this guidance so that it can help to be implemented in your organization. So my work with the JCT suggests that this may well be incorporated into the 2024 editions of the JCT as a joint code of practice. Of course, we haven't seen the final versions yet, so we will wait to see whether that is the case, but word on the street is that it is coming down the line. Now, after this session, these slides will be shared and I've included a link on this slide for you to access and download this guidance for free. And of course, it is good to get ahead of what's coming down the line in the industry. 
So fundamentally, it's about tackling the underlying causes that lead to water escape. It's in its fifth edition already. It's got a large focus on commercial and multi-tenure residential developments. That's where the biggest losses have been seen in recent years. But this, this content is put together in collaboration with parties like the Joint Contracts Tribunal. It promotes proactivity and allocation of the resources. It's going to suggest ways to tackle the root causes of the escape. And it's got advice to mitigate the effect following an instance. At the back of the document is a plan. It's a template, so it's there, it's made nice and easy for people in the industry to follow. People often say, what should that plan contain? Well, my answer is, unfortunately, it's not quite as simple as one size fits all. Of course, we all know that every site and every construction project is different. So it's really important that whatever templates, whatever content is available to the sector is flexible, and it can be tailored to the risk profile, the unique nature of each and every development. But it will consider things like mitigation. So will the water supply be isolated? Will pumps be turned off outside working hours? Is there a formal recorded procedure to control those isolations? Is there gonna be a device installed to monitor flow rates and rapidly shut down the system? You might be aware that there's already AI enabled devices out there that give early detection of leaks. They create algorithmic uh, learning to understand what the normal use of water is in a building, and then uh, effectively shut the systems down temporarily if they identify anything abnormal. Of course, sometimes one of the key questions is if there are water management devices put in place during construction, will they be hand handed over to the owner or will they be removed uh, prior to occupation? It's about testing and commissioning as well, including that requirement, maybe for initial air tests prior to filling the systems up. And then as we talked about the emergency response, even with the best intentions, these things still happen. So who do you need to talk to? Where are the isolation valves? What are your priorities when something suddenly happens, such as an escape of water? So I hope that's given everybody on this call today some food for thought. I hope it's been useful and interesting and insightful because, as I say, this is all about learning. It's all about the adaptation of the industry. And I hope that that's going to help. So do get in touch with me after this session if you'd like to discuss anything about the uh, presentation further. I'll now be uh, passing over to Stephen, who's going to provide you with updates about recent construction and engineering legal cases. Thank you. Thank you, Jason, and um, thank you so much for that really interesting insight into uh, into some key and current issues in the in the industry. Um, that was excellent. Um, I won't keep you long. I want to give a very brief update this morning on a on some uh, some interesting construction cases. I'll very much be following on from um, my colleague Patrick earlier. Um, he mentioned that uh, adjudication decisions are temporarily binding. Uh, and ultimately you pay now and argue later. So the first two cases are, are very much in that vein. And the third case I'm going to talk about adjudication enforcement and um, offers of settlement in particular, Part 36 offers, offers. If we could go to our first slide, please. So this is the case of Sudlows and Global uh, Switch Estates. Um, as you can see from the slides, uh, Global engaged Sudlows to carry out fit out works at their East India dock in uh, dock house in London. Um, the project was considerably delayed, um, which some of you may know causes a, a, a massive amount of loss to parties. Um, and in this case, there was a, a series of series of adjudications, which is um, which is fairly common when you've got complex projects um, and the parties are uh, in dispute. Um, it, it happens as there are a number of issues that need to be resolved to break deadlocks. Um, the works involved the creation of a new private electricity substation at the site. Um, this in turn involved laying high voltage cables um, through the premises on the main road uh, and duct work was therefore required. Now in the uh, fifth adjudication, Global was found to be contractually 
um, responsible for the provision of the, the duck works. Um, and as a result, um, that was deemed to have caused the delay. Um, and that all ties into ass assigning the the blame, if you like, who has caused who has caused the delay and therefore who should bear um, the losses that flow from it and who should pay the other side. Now, in the sixth adjudication, Global tried to reopen this issue by uh, after obtaining new evidence, but the adjudicator ultimately felt bound by felt bound by the previous decision, which is um, quite right. But rather unusually, the adjudicator issued an alternative decision um, to the effect that if if this isn't correct, this is what I would have decided. Um, an odd approach, but there we go. Um, it, ultimately, it went to the TCC, and the adjudic uh, the TCC decided the adjudicator had acted in breach of natural justice which is one of the grounds for um, resisting enforcement of adjudicator's decision, um, as he'd been wrong to follow the previous adjudicator's decision, which is a very unusual. It's, it's, previous decisions are binding, even on adjudicators. Um, ultimately, that was appealed, and the Court of, decision, uh, the Court of Appeal said that um, the previous adjudicator's decision was binding until it was subsequently overturned um, by the court. So ultimately, the key takeaway from this case is that um, adjudication decisions are temporarily binding. If an issue has been decided by an adjudicator, that is subsequently binding on the subsequent adjudicator until such time as the court is involved and makes a final determination on that issue. Um, and that takes us on quite nicely to our next case where where just that happened. So if we could go over to the next slide, please. So this is the case of ISG and FK construction. Um, again, it involved a series of adjudications. Um, and the first the first adjudication decision um, that we're going to talk about is was in February 2023. Um, and Mr. Woods, the adjudicator, ordered 1.75 um, million in favour of S FK, uh, FK construction, and that was owing to SR ISG's failure to serve a valid payment slash pay less notice. It's that smash and grab claim that Patrick was referring to earlier. Now, that uh, that decision was underpinned by a previous decision of Mr. Scheuer, who decided that payment applications made one day after they should be made was still valid in accord, accordance with the contract. Seems a bit tenuous to me, but um, it was that was the decision and it, it was therefore followed. Um, on the 13th of April, there was a subsequent decision uh, regarding the true value of FK's works, um, which was roughly 3.7 million. Now, subsequently, the court ordered that um, Mr. Scheuer had been wrong when he decided that um, an application one day late was in accordance with the contract. Um, therefore, the whole basis that underpinned the award of 1.75 million, um, which is the first point on the slide, had been totally un undermined. The court had made a final decision on the on that matter. Uh, therefore, uh, the TCC, the Technology and Construction Court, um, said. Mr. Scheuer had been wrong in that determination and therefore uh, the claimant ISG was entitled to be paid, repaid 1.75 million. Um, and the Malloy decision, the true value decision had technically been rendered, rendered OTOs, which means of no practical benefit because uh, the result had already been achieved. Um, so the, the, what we've seen is that adjudication decisions are temporarily binding. However, if the parties don't like the decision um, and they don't like a principle that's been decided by an adjudicator, they, they are at liberty to ask the court to make a final determination on the matter. Uh, with that, it brings me to my last slide and I will go through it as uh, swiftly as possible because I know we have some burning questions. This is the case of uh, Sleaford Building Services and Isoplus uh, Piping Systems. This concerned an enforcement of an adjudicator's decision. Uh, in this case, Isoplus was um, asking the court to um, 
enforce the decision. It had also made a Part 36 offer um, to Sleaford. Now, those of you who haven't come across Part 36 offers before, they are um, very powerful offers. They're offers with teeth. They're prescribed by the uh, civil procedure rules and they have very specific consequences um, if in the event that the court awards an offer, awards the sum that's at least the same as your offer or it's better than. So in this case, Isoplus uh, made the offer in the sum of 323,000. Um, the, the sum awarded by the court was exactly the same, plus some interest. Now, Sleaford's lawyers were arguing it'd be unjust for uh, Part 36 con cost consequences to apply, which, which are very onerous. It's a 10% uplift on everything you've claimed, enhanced costs, indemnity costs, interest, that sort of thing. Um, it, it's, quite, it's quite powerful. That's why it forces, it, it places a lot of pressure on, uh, on a defendant or indeed a claimant, depending on who makes the author. The court was was only really concerned with whether or not it would be unjust to to apply Part 36 cons, cost consequences here, and the court decided that the offer was to settle the whole of the principal sum um, for, for the sum claimed. So really, it wasn't a genuine attempt to settle at all. Um, it offered no compromise, and it was such a small concession um, in relation to the interest element that it amounted to 99.99% of the amount awarded. Um, on balance, the court said, that's not enough, that's not a compromise um, at all, and it would be unjust to apply Part 36 cons cost consequences. Um, so that's all from me. Thank you very much for listening. I'll, I'll hand back to Catherine now and we'll, we'll um, uh, answer any burning questions. Thanks very much, Stephen. Um, I'm conscious of time, so we will just ask a couple of the questions that have come through. Um, oh, there's Patrick. Brilliant. Patrick, I have one for you to start with. Um, questions come through about the notice of adjudication, um, mm -hmm. whether it's possible such a way as to prevent counterclaims or monies being claimed by the responding party? So uh, there's, there's two points there and the answer's yes and no. Um, <laughs> I'll deal with them in, 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 in turn. So the, the scope of the notice, yes, is very important. It sets the jurisdiction of the adjudicator, what he's empowered to decide. So first part of the question is, can you draft the notice in such a way as to prevent money is being awarded to the responding party. Well, yes, you can. Um, you can do that by, if you're claiming money, for example, the, the dispute you would refer is you would ask the adjudicator to, to award you, you know, £100,000. So to award to the referring party the sum of £100,000 or such other sum as the adjudicator deems appropriate. That, that last wording is important because if you ask for £100,000 full stop, and the adjudicator decides that you're you're due 95, um, then they can't order you that 95. So it's important to just extend it in that way. But if if you draft it with that sort of wording, then they can't award monies in the other direction. You're asking them to award you such money as as, as they deem appropriate. Um, the second question is slightly different: is can you draft the notice to prevent the other side raising counterclaims? Um, well not if if what you mean is that you you want to limit their um, counterclaims or cross claims which are relevant to their defense which would limit the sum due to you the, the adjudicator is not going to allow that because you're sort of restricting the responding party's ability to defend themselves if these counterclaims are part of the dispute essentially then they'll be able to raise them to sort of um yeah reduce the sum due and and assist their defense but you could but it wouldn't be able to go so far as to uh, being an award in favor of the defendant if you draft the notice in the right way as i've just described thank you um, and i'm going to just stick with you if that's all right because there's an, just another point to clarify um obviously yourself and stephen were talking about um adjudication decisions being interim binding and we've had a question to suggest that um uh, you can see some decisions being referred to as final and binding. Um, can we just clarify when that might be the case? 
Well, that is true. I mean, the interim binding principle is the sort of default position under the Construction Act. Um, but you could agree for an adjudicator's decision to be final and binding in your contract. And in fact, some standard form contracts do uh, do that or at least move in that direction. For example, the standard um, um, NEC option W2 provides that an, an adjudication can be uh, will be final and binding if you don't notify the other side that you're dissatisfied with it um, within four weeks. So there you've got a sort of condition precedent and if you don't sort of uh, send that notice within four weeks it will sort of become finally binding. So yes in certain situations it, it can be. Thank you. Um, one quickly for you Jason. Um, the question has come in, at what stage in the project do insurers expect a water management plan to be in place? Thank you, Catherine. Uh, yeah, it's a good question, actually. Um, so what we tend to see is particularly for projects that have a high exposure to escape of water, they will ask for it to have been drafted at the outset of that project. Now, sometimes it's not possible in practical terms to do that because if you haven't uh, appointed your subcontractors for any of those related works it's very hard to prepare a, a complete plan so what we try to negotiate with insurers at that stage is that one will be prepared prior to the commencement of any related internal water systems and, and works thank you that's really helpful. Um, right, I'm going to have to cut off the questions there, I'm afraid, because um, I'm conscious we're running over. I'm sure people have got places to be, but um, please do uh, come back to any of us. You've got our details on the slides um, and we'd be really grateful also if you filled in our feedback as you uh, leave the session, let us know anything else you'd be interested to hear about in our future sessions. And um, we hope you all join us for the next one, which is on the 14th of November. So thank you very much. Thank you.